All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Is everyone having a good afternoon? Yeah, wow. I actually got like a decent number of nods and smiles. So exciting. And everyone got a snack. Was it cookies or biscuits? Same. All right, cool. Okay, so we're going to get started. And I'm going to warn everyone that this is a new thing that I'm trying. Probably should wait to the end to tell you guys that. But this is a new thing I'm trying. We're going to see how it goes. I'm excited because I'm going to show you guys a lot of things. But I just hope no one's brains melt or anything. Um, my name is Anna Hoffman. I work for the Microsoft Databases team. I used to do a lot of stuff on Azure SQL, and I still do. Uh, but today, I wanted to try to look across Microsoft database offering. So just a quick show of hands, if you've used a service outside of SQL Server and Azure SQL, so that's like Cosmos DB, Azure Database for Postgres, Azure Database for MySQL, can you give me a wave? OK, so a decent number of you. Uh, person, like Another question. How many of you are, are regularly or at some level using both Microsoft proprietary databases as well as things like uh, open source databases? A couple. And how many of you are fully Microsoft shop? OK, most of you. All right, so be interesting. Uh, what I hope you all walk away from today is learning at least something new. We're going to talk about a lot of things. I hope at least something is new. We're going to show a lot of demos. We're going to see how some things land. And I really, I'm going to share some feedback at the end. Like I would love to get feedback here because trying to figure out how we tell this story to talk about Microsoft databases, but also talk about how the innovations we're doing in other spaces feed into the innovations we do in our Microsoft databases. So that's the spiel. We'll get right into it, um, maybe. All right, so I don't need to spend a lot of time here saying data is a strategic asset, data is growing like crazy. Uh, but I do want to point out that like over the past couple years, especially since the pandemic, I think other people besides us have started to realize that as well. So just wanted to call that out. Now, for folks who are just working with Azure SQL and just working with SQL Server, it might be news that we actually have a whole lot of Azure database services. Um, but of course, if we think about our history, we started with SQL Server, obviously, a very long time ago. And we since evolved into the cloud to Azure SQL. And we've done things like Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Managed Instance, SQL Server on VMs. We've had a lot of success in this space. Now, one of the things that we did actually quite a few years ago is we realized, hey, the number two or three or something, somewhere in the top five, top popu most popular database engines are MySQL and Postgres. Um, so we see a lot of adoption there. We see a lot of people wanting to use those services so they don't get locked in, so they can pay less, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we want to have something as a company that helps open source folks get platform as a service options on Azure. So we came out with something we call OSS, our open source database suite. Uh, we have uh, MySQL, Postgres, and we also have MariaDB. And we've got quite a few customers running on here, You know, maybe about 100,000 or so databases, uh, actually probably a good bit more than that, are running open source in Azure. Because you can get this PaaS benefit, but you also feel like you can leave if you want. Then we entered the non-relational space. Anyone use Cosmos DB before? A couple folks. Um, OK, so this is a NoSQL database engine. And we have a couple different options. Again, we're leaning a lot on some of these open source or relatively open source offerings to give you flexibility in options. Uh, now, I've heard the alternative side of this is like, hey, there's way too many options. Uh, but I choose to, to choose that this is more of a flexibility thing. Um, OK, so then we said, OK, this isn't enough. You know, We want to bring these databases anywhere. So we started with Azure with most of these services. But if you can see kind of the trend and some of the things that we're doing with Azure Arc and on-prem and edge, we're trying to, trying to bring these Azure services and these innovations everywhere. And I hope that's a theme that kind of plays throughout this session. 
Now, if you think about some of the numbers, because I'm a numbers person, I pulled some numbers on some things we have. So over 65 million downloads of SQL Server today, over 5 million databases running on our service, the number's probably closer to seven or eight. Uh, 100 trillion transactions per day are run on Cosmos DB. Um, and then we also have some very, very large workloads running on our open source databases. And across all of this, we have migration services to help you get to where you want to go. And so today, you know, I struggled with where I wanted to take this session because there's a lot of different places we could go. We could go back to the beginning, talk about architectures. But today, I thought I'd focus on three things. I want to focus on flexible modernization, so this idea of modernizing legacy apps, migrating to the cloud or to other platforms, that sort of thing. I also want to talk about data services integration. It's not just enough to have your data in one place, right? We need to be able to get insights over it. We need to get security over it. Maybe you saw this morning or in other sessions about government governance over all our data. These are all really important things. And finally, I just have a few areas that might seem subtle, but really show how we're bringing innovation into this space. And then if we have some time at the end, or if anyone's interested, I'm also happy to share some of the innovations we're investing in as we go forward. All right, so let's start with modernization. Now, the angle we take here, the angle I, I'd like to, to express is that every app and database is eventually going to be modernized, right? It's going to need to be updated, upgraded, security things change, protocols change, uh, requirements change. Um, and, you know, we've seen that's true across the industry. So here are some stats from Gartner and Flexera and such. Like 90% of existing apps will still be in use. In This was for 2021. Uh, but modernizing to the cloud is becoming a cl top priority. Similarly, we saw 72% of organizations uh, say that, hey, the pandemic has accelerated our digital transformation. Has anyone seen that in their organizations? A couple people. And uh, a lot of folks said, about 60% people said, 60 of people said that they are making a bigger effort to migrate to the cloud. You all know this. All right, so what are we doing in this space? Well, we've been doing a lot of things in this space. Uh, regardless of how you're trying to migrate, where you're trying to go to, we have lots of different tools. So we have Azure Migrate, which is your place to get scalable migrations. We have SQL Server Migration Assistant. So if you're migrating from Oracle or some other engine than SQL Server to Azure, we have tools for that to help you translate that knowledge. And there's actually an exciting session, I believe, by Alexandra later this week on that. Uh, we have Data Migration Assistant. And Data Migration Assistant is an interesting one that we'll come back to because we invested in something here called the, uh, the SKU Recommender. Anyone heard of the SKU Recommender? It wasn't used super frequently. It was like a console app that you had to run in the back of DMA. And then eventually, it gave you some performance recommendations about your tool. Well, we worked with the data science team here to make that better. So I'm going to show you how we've improved that and made that a little bit better in a second. Then we have services to help you migrate. So Azure Database Migration Service. You can now migrate with Azure Data Studio. And then there's all these tools for optimizing. So this is great, lots of tools. But on the other side, this is a lot of tools, right? Like, What do you need? Yet another tool for yet another thing you're trying to do. So I think this goes into uh, modernization, but also innovation. Because one of the things that we've invested heavily into is bringing a lot of these tools right into Azure Data Studio. So and using the extension capability so we can really update that quickly. We can make changes. We can innovate as we get feedback from you all. So I want to take a look. And we'll see how this works. Um, but I want to take a look at it, a demo. Uh, and this demo is pre-recorded. I'll just come out and say it. Um, so I'll stop a couple times and zoom a couple times and we won't do the whole thing. Um, but this demo is going to show you this new experience in Azure Data Studio. But the exciting part to me, um, so I'm going to kick this off and then when it gets there, I'll, I'll kind of show you guys. Uh, but the exciting part to me is the SKU recommender thing I said. Hey, this thing was kind of hard to use. It used to be very manual and rules-based. But then we brought in our data science team and said, hey, let's, let's work on this together and let's make it really great. So essentially what we're doing here is we're just setting up the migration extension. We're going to go ahead and kick off uh, the migration workflow. So I'm going to just go ahead and kick, kick ahead. 
And I'm also going to zoom in here because I notice that it's very hard to see sometimes in these rooms. Let's see. Is that a little better for folks? Yeah. OK. So what we see is that we're going to run an assessment, essentially, and tell you where you can go for your migration, where we think you can land, whether it's SQL MI or SQL Server and Azure Virtual Machine. Now, what we're doing up here in the right is saying, hey, would you like a recommendation on which SKU you should do, like maybe how many vCores you need, what IOPS do you need, how much storage you need, all that. So you can either say, hey, I'll collect some performance data, or I've already collected some performance data. And so what we're doing here, again, a little hard to see here, but we're going to start collecting workload information about your server. And we're going to get some initial recommendations. Now, this runs over the course of 10 minutes, but that's probably kind of hard to get a really good understanding of what your workloads are, right? Maybe your workloads fluctuate. If you run this in the middle of the night and no one's using the database, that might not be a great picture. So one of the things I think is cool is you can leave this running for a couple days if you want, a week if you want, to understand and get better performance recommendations. And we're using all the data and experience that we have from doing migrations at scale to help you understand where you should land in Azure. So I just think this is really interesting. Again, a little hard to see here, but essentially we're saying after the analysis, this is how much CPU you need, this is how much IOPS you need, and based on all this, we're going to recommend a certain SKU of Azure SQL. So I think that's pretty cool, and I just wanted to share that with you all. If you're more interested in learning about this, there is a migration session uh, from our team. Mohammed, the guy who builds this whole thing, uh, is going to be presenting more about that. All right, so it's not just about migrating Azure SQL stuff. We're also doing a lot of work to migrate you from Postgres to Postgres, MySQL to MySQL, Oracle to Postgres, you name it, we got it. This link, aka.ms slash data migration, this is a really cool link because what it does is, is, is it's like one of those choose your destiny uh, links. So you go there and you say, hey, I'm coming from SQL Server 2012 and I want to go to Azure SQL Managed Instance. So you get all these different options, and we'll give you a custom guide, all the tools, all the recommendations, so you can get going. So this is one of the ways I feel like we're really supporting that factor that every app and database is going to need to be modernized. Uh, one example of a customer that I like to talk about when we talk about modernizing uh, is H&R Block. And all their architecture, all that aside, what's interesting about H&R Block is that they took a phased migration approach. So they took all their SQL servers running on-prem, they failed them over to SQL Server virtual machines in Azure. And then they started to, once they got it all up and running, everything's hooked up in Azure, then they started to slowly pick workloads that could go to Azure SQL Managed Instance. So this is something we actually see with a lot of customers. They take this phased approach to migrating as they can, bit by bit, piece by piece, and with the application as well. So that's one way we're helping you modernize, in a sense of migration. Now, what if you don't want to go to Azure, but you do want to get Azure benefits? That's where Azure Arc comes into play. And Azure Arc is really a game changer to me because this is going to allow you to get Azure services. So basically get those managed versionless services that you might have been hearing about in Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL Managed Instance uh, anywhere you can run Kubernetes, essentially. So this is a big space we've been investing in. We currently have Azure SQL Managed Instance available in general availability in Azure Arc. And we have Postgres Hyperscale, which we'll talk a little bit about later what that is. Um, available in preview as well. And so this is a really interesting space because you can start to get these Azure benefits. Now, all right, so we, we tell everyone this, and they're like, oh, yeah, this sounds great. And then they're like, what's Kubernetes? <laughs> and, you know, that's a, a challenge to get through. But we said, OK, fair. Uh, what if we could give you Azure benefits in your on-prem SQL Server? without you having to deploy Kubernetes and figure all that out. You can just start getting benefits of Azure. So we have this thing called Azure Arc Enabled SQL Server. And this is going to allow you to start getting Azure benefits on your existing SQL servers. Now, this isn't going to give you fully managed versionless SQL, but you're going to start to get uh, some benefits here that you might feel like taking advantage of. All right, so that's. <laughs> Flexible modernization. Um, I'll pause and just check any questions.
We're good? All right. Keep me honest. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is data services integration. And I also want to put an aside here that uh, this isn't just Anna coming up with stuff that she thinks is important. Uh, this was part of the pieces from this I uh, have taken from our leadership. So these are the things that we're investing in as a company, as Microsoft, in databases. So the second area is data services integration. So what is that? So to us, this means analytics and governance over all your data, and also that it's very easy for you to connect to your applications and see that data and work with that data in a secure fashion. So some of the big things for us in this space right now as a company are going to be Synapse, Power BI, and Purview. Everyone's heard of those? Yeah. Awesome. Anyone using these services? Anyone not using these services? Yeah, so these are all services folks are familiar with and using or starting to, to use. Now, the first thing I wanted to talk about in this space is Azure Purview. Uh, folks back in the day may be familiar with Data Catalog. Anyone remember Azure Data Catalog? Um, so think about this is like, hey, we took Azure Data Ca Catalog and said, let's do something really just blow them out of the water that's a little bit better than Azure Data Catalog. And I think one of the big problems with Azure Data Catalog was a lot of it was very manual. And so that's what Azure Purview is really invested in, uh, helping you do a lot of this mapping, cataloging, and lineage as well. Um, and you can see we're working hard as a team internally to make sure that these things all plug in nicely with SQL Server, with Azure SQL, with Cosmos DB, uh, with all of our, our data services. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is kind of this gap we've seen in the past between operational systems and analytical systems. Now, we've seen this for a while. I think everyone here is probably familiar with it. We're seeing a couple things in the industry. One thing we're seeing in the industry is analytic systems are starting to support operational workloads. We're also seeing that from our side, analytic systems need to be able to better access data in operational systems, right? We don't want to always have to do this ETL or ELT uh, to get our data into an analytic system to then do analytics on top of it. Real-time analytics is more important. There's more data that we're all trying to deal with. And so maybe you saw where this was going, but Azure Synapse Link is really providing that bridge between analytic systems and operational systems. For those of you that were in the keynote this morning, you saw Azure Synapse link between SQL Server 2022 and Azure Synapse. So that's one way we're bridging that gap. Also helps towards modernization and this idea of hybrid. But another thing that we've done in the past is we released this with Cosmos DB initially. Um, of course, we are planning to build this for uh, SQL DB as well. And ideally, we would build this for all of our data services, even our open source ones. Uh, but know that SQL DB is something we're working on. It's not available today. Uh, but the idea here is you can govern all your data with Azure Purview and do analytics over all your data with Synapse and Synapse Link. And you also might notice this in the bottom left, Cosmos DB has done a little bit more here in this space since they've been around a little longer. And one thing really interesting to me that I found recently was this one-click Power BI integration with Cosmos DB. So I thought we'd take a second and we take a look at what this is. Um, again, I have recorded this, so I will pause every once in a while and zoom in. OK, so this is an Azure Cosmos DB account. It's currently working in the serverless mode, which is kind of similar to Azure SQL databases. And this is my Azure Synapse Analytics workspace. So I have some files here in Azure Data Lake Storage or ADLS. And essentially, I can use uh, I can use the Spark pool to kind of bring these bring this data into my workspace if I like, or bring this data into Cosmos DB. This is just kind of a setup, but this was a whole new experience for me, so I figured I'd just record all of this so we could see it. So now you see we have these, uh, these uh, CSV files. And uh, very similar, if you were in the, the keynote this morning, you saw this technology called Polybase, right, and data virtualization. So just like we can do it for SQL, we can do it for Cosmos DB from Synapse. So here what I'm able to do is I'm essentially, I'm talking slower than I'm going, uh, is I can create a view 
uh, using Open Rosette to Cosmos DB very, very easily, just bring that data in so I can start to look at it. And then I can start to do things like aggregations and joins with other data I might have in Synapse or other data that I might have available, but using some of the power of Synapse behind it. Now we're going to be able to see uh, some of the things like revenue, advertising, blah, 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 for our data set. Now this is, this is kind of cool, but this isn't the cool part to me. This wasn't the cool part to me. So the cool part is we're going to go back uh, to Azure Cosmos DB, and they've added this support for uh, one-click Power BI. You're like, huh, this sounds nice. How is this going to work? So this is me trying this for the first time. So I go over, first I wanted to make sure that we did have data in this Cosmos DB account. So we did the setup, we have the data there. We can see uh, some of those tables there. We also have those views that we created that kind of pulled in the data from the CSVs. Okay, so here, let me pause. All right, so what we're doing here is we clicked to enable one-click Power BI. And so what this is doing is say, hey, enable Synapse Link so that we have the power to do this. So we're in Cosmos DB. We're going to go enable Synapse Link. So assume we hadn't done some of the other steps because they're not necessarily needed here. And I'm going to zoom in again just to make sure you guys can see. So we're connecting to the workspace. We're connecting to the Cosmos DB uh, database that I have. And it's going to create the views for me. So I didn't have to go figure out how to do the open row set, find the Cosmos DB key. And it's going to do all that. And then it's going to say, here's a Power BI file. Which tables would you like to look at or which views? I can select them. And then essentially, let me zoom back out. <laughs> Essentially, what it's going to do is it's going to bring in all the connections for me. It's going to bring in all the tables for me, and I can just start working with this data. I don't know how many of you have worked with data in Power BI, but sometimes it takes me longer than I'd like to admit just to do that much. <laughs> um, but now you can see I have them all available, and I can go in. I can start to create my data model, and I can start to play around. And very easily, I'm able to go to Insight. So I think this is interesting because this shows a very shortened time to Insight, right? Um, so this was something that stood out to me. And as we see, this is something for Cosmos DB. You can kind of see where Microsoft's headed, right? They did this for Cosmos DB. It's very likely, potentially, that they'll try to do something very similar for our other database services. And I think that's one of the good things. Again, you just see me playing around here. I'm not a Power BI wizard. Uh, but I think that's one of the interesting things about this new movement that Microsoft is working towards across all our databases is that we're going to be able to start pulling these innovations from different services, I think, into uh, other services. All right, so again, I'm just playing around here. Uh, the point is you can go from uh, data to insights very quickly with data in Cosmos DB using this one-click Power BI. All right. So now I want to talk about some innovations. And again, I really struggled in this space because you know you go to any of Bob Ward sessions or any of really the Microsoft team sessions here, all you're hearing about is innovation. So how could I pick just a few? I decided I'd pick a few that maybe you all haven't heard about, assuming most of you are SQL Server and Azure SQL people. And hopefully what you see here helps you kind of think about the possibilities in Azure and the possibilities that we have as an Azure SQL team to provide more things for you. Uh, so those of you that aren't familiar with some of our open source stack, uh, originally we had this thing called Azure Database for X service. Uh, running on single server. Now, this was like our kind of original architecture of doing things behind the scenes. And over the past year, we've gone through the preview and GA of flexible server. And in fact, we think flexible server is so much better than single server that we're telling everybody, leave single server, come to flexible server. Uh, so this was a pretty big deal for the open source team. Uh, some of the big things that came in this, this iteration, a uh, couple things. So we added network isolation with VNet integration. So this is very similar, if you're familiar with Azure SQL Managed Instance, to what you get in Azure SQL Managed Instance. Uh, we added some more server parameters, and we added custom maintenance windows. Anyone familiar with custom maintenance windows? OK, so custom maintenance windows, or they're called maintenance windows in Azure SQL, uh, is basically the ability for you to tell Microsoft when you want updates to be to happen. Sure, it's a versionless database. But of course, we're going to have to do updates behind the scenes at some point. So what 
maintenance windows allows you to do in Azure SQL is pick a time range. Do you want weeknights? Do you want weekend nights? Do you want weekdays or weekend days? Those are your options, which is great, right? You want to know when these updates are happening. And depending on your workload, you want to pick one that makes more sense. Maintenance windows for MySQL and Postgres on Flexible Server, one hour. You pick a one hour slot. You say, hey, on Saturday mornings from 2 to 3 AM, that's the only time I want you to do maintenance. And so we're giving you much more granularity here. So again, I can't make promises here. But you might draw <laughs> some sort of ideas from what we've done in the open source space to what might be coming to Azure SQL. One example. All right. Another example, who is familiar with availability zones? A couple people. Uh, for those who aren't, I'll just give a very quick overview. Uh, essentially, when you deploy anything, right? Uh, a lot of times we deploy with some sort of redundancy, or we deploy to, a, of course, we're going to deploy to a specific reason. So in a region, right, we don't have just one data center. We have multiple data centers in a region in Azure. And what a zone is, is a zone essentially means, hey, we have separate cooling, water, heating, power, and we're in a separate building from another zone in the same region. So the reason zones came to be is because some people wanted to have their databases or other things in Azure with zone redundant configuration. So that means, hey, I deployed to West US, but I want this to be zone redundant. So if there's a huge fire in a data center, I'm not screwed, right? I still have data in other, other zones in that region. Um, and for other regions that are smaller, and maybe you can't go to a different region for your database backups or whatever because of your country maybe only has one region. So you can't really do that without violating certain compliance rules. Uh, so that was a big reason behind zones. But what we've done in the MySQL flexible, MySQL and PostgreSQL flexible server space is said, hey, you can pick which zone you want your database to be in. In Azure SQL right now, we abstract all that away from you. But in Flexible Server, we say, hey, you want it to be in zone two, it can be in zone two. Any ideas why that's valuable? So if I have a VM or an application, I have my database in zone two, where do I want my VM or application? Zone two, exactly. So now you have the ability to put your before, right, you put your VM, your app, your database in the same region. That's pretty much close you get. Maybe you could do a couple things with networking to try to get these things close together. But now you can put them in the same zone so you can ensure they're as close as possible. So that's an interesting innovation available in Flexible Server today, not Azure SQL yet. Um, and then some other things around start-stop. So uh, Flexible Server has a start-stop capability. So unlike Azure SQL Serverless, folks familiar with Azure SQL Serverless? A little. Um, serverless allows you to auto scale and auto pause if no one's using it. Flexible server allows you to go in and say stop. <laughs> and then when you can stop it, I think up to seven or 30 days, depending on the service. So maybe you don't need it. Maybe you're doing dev work, whatever. Um, you can just stop it. And you can also use burstable servers, which allows you to kind of save money and then burst when you need to burst. All right, so I got pretty into this, I'll be honest. Like, I've been learning about Azure SQL, SQL Server for a long time. I didn't know anything about these services till recently. I was like, wow, it's so cool what they're doing, a lot of innovations. So I worked with someone on the MySQL team to tell me like, hey, you said single servers, flexible server is so much better than single server that we're just moving everyone. We want everyone to move to flexible server. Can you show me why? Um, so I'm going to show a demo. Again, it's recorded, sorry. Uh, I will zoom in here uh, because the demo were, uh, let's see. OK, so what do we have? So we have a Linux virtual machine here. Uh, and this Linux virtual machine, I'm not sure if you can see from this view, uh, but this is a Linux virtual machine. It's running in West US 2, and it's actually running in zone 2, because I can pick which availability zone I want it to run in. All right, so that's kind of the setup for that. Uh, so that's the virtual machine. This is essentially a virtual machine where we're going to do some performance testing. So since I'm doing performance testing, I want this virtual machine to be as close to the database as possible, putting it in zone two in West US. All right, so now let me pause so you can see. This is uh, Azure database. Oh, it's still really grainy. Let's see. OK, you'll just have to trust me. This is Azure database for MySQL 
single server. It's also in West US too. And we can see over here that it's a memory optimized 16 V core, eight terabyte database. All right, so if we keep playing, what we're gonna see is some of the options. So remember, this is single server. This was like the old, old version of Azure database for MySQL. Now, if we go into the pricing tier, what we're going to see is we pick the number of the storage and we pick the vCore. And from an IOPS perspective, see we can use up to 20,000 IOPS. That's gonna scale with storage. So if I want more IOPS, whether or not I need the storage, I'm gonna have to scale up storage and pay for storage. Now, if we go back, we can look, I got ahead of myself. All right, if we go back, this is now MySQL Flexible Server. Again, you're just gonna have to trust me. This is in West US 2. And if we come over here, this is now we're using Memory Optimized and it's 16 V cores. And we'll take a look at this storage because it's hard to see here, but we're in Availability Zone 2. So same availability zone as the VM we're doing testing in, which might be a good thing, we'll find out. And then if we take a look at the compute and storage, here's another cool thing. And again, this is something that's slightly different from in Azure SQL, the way IOPS works, but they've actually been able to separate storage and IOPS altogether. So you can scale up your IOPS without having to scale up your storage or vice versa uh, and pay accordingly. All right. All right. Okay, I'm gonna let this play. Um, so now that we've kind of seen what we're dealing with, uh, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the results of some performance benchmarking testing that we did. Uh, so again, I'm gonna zoom in here, but I'll tell you if we're looking at single server or flexible server. So this is, ah. I had a feeling that might happen. Okay, let's see. Thanks guys, sorry for hang, hang in there. I'm gonna get there. Well, it's a video, so it can't break. But I just was bad with Zoom. All right, let's try this again. Nope, nope. Okay, let me try one more time. I'm sorry, guys. I should have fixed this before. Okay, so, oh my goodness, one more time. This is it, I can feel it. We're gonna go here. If not, I'll just talk you guys through it. It's no point. All right, here we go. This is what we wanna see. Okay, so this is on single server. So again, this is the old version. So what I want you to notice is we're gonna run this same test. We're not gonna get into the details of the test here. We're running the same test on both single server and flexible server. We're getting about almost 65,000 queries per second we're able to run on single server. And our average latency, you can see we're getting some, some high latency, but our average latency is about 600 milliseconds per query, which is not great. Could be worse, but not great. Uh, so this is on single server. Now, if we flip over to flexible server, that's what we're looking at now, just confirming it's the same test, we're getting 116,000 queries per second. So this is you know, at least 50% more. And our uh, average latency was 43 milliseconds compared to single server, which was 600 seconds. So you can see by innovating and creating this new modern architecture, we've really been able to enhance the performance for our customers for MySQL. And then this last thing I just wanted to show is the maintenance schedule. So again, you can pick a custom schedule. You pick the day of the week, and again, just a one hour time period where you want this to happen. Now, if there are critical updates that are required, we'll still go and apply those. Uh, but otherwise, we'll pick that one hour every 30 days to apply maintenance to your database. So kind of cool, huh? Had anyone seen this before? Interesting, maybe. And maybe it gives you some ideas for things that could be coming at some point to Azure SQL or other things that you're using today in Azure. All right. 
Okay, so I want to tell another story. This is more of an industry story. And again, I am looking for feedback at the end if all this context is useful. But industry story, a uh, couple years ago, maybe 10 years ago, more than that, a little bit, uh, people might have been familiar with like this NoSQL boom. Like We were like, hey, we can get better performance with NoSQL databases. And we don't really need relational databases anymore. We're just going to go non-relational NoSQL. And there was a huge boom in, in the NoSQL space. And then maybe five, seven years later, uh, some folks said, you know, a lot of our stuff is still relational. Uh, but it, we want it to be more scalable. So they came up with this thing called New SQL. Have anyone heard of New SQL? N-E-W SQL? You read about it online. It's just a trend. And the idea with New SQL is like, hey, let's build extensions that keep the database relational but add scalability. And that was the new SQL space. And then a couple years after that, and this is kind of where we're getting to today, there's this trend called distributed SQL. And that says, hey, let's, let's blend this NoSQL engine. So we're going to have key values at the bottom. We'll throw relational on top of it. And then it will really, really scale. You get the best of both worlds. Let's talk about new SQL, though. So new SQL extends. Uh, extends relational databases to be more scalable. Anyone heard of Citus? Okay, so Citus is a company that we acquired a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, uh, and they built a Postgres extension. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Postgres, Postgres allows all these different extensions uh, to do different things. Citus was essentially a new SQL extension. So it allows you to plug into Postgres and all of a sudden create distributed tables or reference tables. So we're going to help you shard your database, shard your queries, all that stuff so that you can get performance on a relational database at scale. Which, interesting enough, is kind of similar to what Azure SQL Hyperscale did in the underlying architecture. Folks familiar with Azure SQL Hyperscale? There's an awesome session tomorrow by Denzel. He's going to go through the architecture of hyperscale. Definitely recommend checking that out and comparing it to what I'm saying here about how we're trying to get more scale, how we're trying to do distributed SQL. Um, but yeah, Citus is something we, we purchased. And then we said, hey, let's combine it with Azure Database for Postgres. So you get this managed service that's also really scalable uh, for big workloads. So essentially what it is is it's open source. So even though we purchased it and we brought it into Azure Database for Postgres, Citus itself is an open source extension. So if you're using Postgres today, you can use it. Um, again, it is going to help you transform your database into a horizontally scalable database. And for those of you familiar with Azure SQL Hyperscale, it's very similar to what we've done. We've been able to scale out so that we can support limitless storage as opposed to scaling up and being uh, restricted by the storage size. So I wanted to show you an example. This was an interesting example to me because it was relevant and also we're in the UK. Uh, maybe some of you are always in the UK, but I am not. Uh, so I came across this. And you can see uh, there's a lot more views than my blogs get. Uh, so it was kind of cool, whatever it was. Uh, but essentially, uh, the UK COVID-19 dashboard uh, started as a small thing, right? Like we were all kind of hacking things together. Not we, I wasn't working on this, but in general, folks were hacking things together to, to try to get the word out, to try to get information out, try to get data out. Um, and it became one of the most vi uh, visited public service websites in the UK. And their infrastructure, they just were not ready for this. So if we take a look at some of the, the, the hits they were getting, so I'm just going to scroll down. So they were using Postgres underneath, right? Um, so if we take a look at what they were getting, they were having oh, 1.5 million users on a daily basis. Sometimes they had 100,000 users trying to query this dashboard, big COVID-19 dashboard at one time, pulling different data, pulling different analysis. Um, so you can see the number of daily requests, all the page views, daily downloads, whatever. Uh, essentially, this thing was getting hammered, and they could not keep up. Uh, so what they did is they reached out to Microsoft. They got engaged with Azure Database for Postgres Hyperscale Citus. So that's the name. And maybe that explains why Hyperscale is in the name, because it's similar to what we're doing with Azure SQL Hyperscale. Uh, or maybe it's just more confusion. Jury's out. Uh, so Azure Database for Postgres Hyperscale Citus, they started running on this, and they were able to uh, withstand and 
uh, exceed this performance and have uh, no issues. Uh, you can see, I know it's kind of hard to see, but you can see at given times the requests per second and the things that were changing and we were logging all this stuff and it was very cool to see. And let me see, control uh, This is the dashboard, of course. Uh, thankfully, things are getting a little bit better, but if you take a look at this, this is all running on uh, Azure Database for Postgres and you can see how much it scales and all the data that it's supporting. So I thought that was just a cool kind of example to take a look at. Uh, and I'll share the link to this. Uh, it's actually just this short link here. Uh, if you want to read about it or see how Postgres hyperscale site scales or anything else interesting, play around with the dashboard. It was kind of interesting. All right, so talked a lot about a lot of different things. Uh, of course, I have to talk about Azure SQL at some point in this uh, because, well, that's where I started and I'm biased. Uh, but Azure SQL has come a long way. SQL Server has come a long way. I could go back to 19, someone to keep me on is 1989. No one's saying anything, so I'm going to assume it's right. 1989 when SQL Server started. Uh, all the way to 2006 when we started Project Red Dog, which was the code name for Azure. And we did all sorts of things. So when we launched Azure, we announced Microsoft SQL Data Services. Uh, it was front and center uh, at the announcement. Uh, and over the years, you can see we've done a couple things. We, we, we renamed Azure SQL Database. We said, hey, we should do SQL Server on Azure Virtual Machines. That's a thing. People want to do that. They want the whole SQL Server. And then we said, Oh, hey, in 2018, we said, hey, people want the whole SQL Server, but they also want the whole managed service. Let's come up with Azure SQL Managed Instance. And then in 2019, we did some crazy stuff. We did a lot of stuff. We came up with, oh, let me not skip Elastic Pools. We said, hey, we have a lot of software as a service customers. They're running a lot of databases on Azure. They need a better way to manage it. So let's come up with Elastic Pools so they can resource uh, optimize and cost optimize, resource share and cost optimize for lots of databases. I mean, we have customers running 600,000 <laughs> databases uh, for different customers uh, in Azure SQL today. Then, got excited, skipped to hyperscale. Talked about hyperscale and serverless a little bit, but we came out with both of these in 2019. It was a big year. Also, SQL Server 2019. Really big year. A lot of the tech that went into the different things came into play. Uh, and then 2020, we rebranded. I just mentioned this because you'll hear people say Azure SQL, and you might not be sure what they're talking about. I'm talking about a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, so one of the things I wanted to kind of dive into uh, talked about Azure SQL database. Uh, maybe you've seen SQL, SQL Ledger, which is basically bringing blockchain to Azure SQL. I think that's an awesome innovation. There's a session on that uh, at some point this week. Um, but what I want to talk about, because I can't talk about all the innovations, is something interesting about intelligent database. Now, one of the, the interesting things about running an Azure SQL is we can see all up, of course, not at a customer level or anything, but we can see all up uh, how many people are using different capabilities related to, say, intelligent performance or query performance. Uh, so you can see some stats here on how many people in the past 24 hours have probably used certain things. So 32 million unique plans using memory grant feedback, uh, 355 million table ver variable deferred compilations, etc. So we're getting some scale. And from this, we're learning. And from this learning, we can bring you new things. So for example, uh, query store hints. This is something that's coming to SQL Server 2022, but has been available in Azure SQL database since last May, I want to say. So a lot of times we can deploy these features much easier to things like Azure SQL Database, test them out, and then when the next version of SQL Server uh, comes out, we can do that as well. A couple other cool innovations. You might have heard that in SQL Server 2022, we're adding support for Query Store on read replicas. Well, that's going to apply to Azure SQL Database as well. So again, another cool thing about the innovation that gets me excited is when we do stuff in one place, and then it leads to another place which might explain why I get so excited when I see all these innovations in Flexible Server, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to come to Azure SQL. It's going to come to SQL Server. It's going to be awesome. Uh, so yeah, I'm getting carried away. But um, you guys get the point. We're doing a lot of cool stuff. Uh, we're always innovating. We're always looking at customer challenges. Um, and it's not just in one area of Azure SQL. All right. So with that, I have one more demo I want to show you all. 
Uh, and this is a demo for hyperscale and serverless. So again, pre-recorded because I'm lazy, but <laughs> let's go through it. So this is a fitness tracking application that I built a while back. It just tracks a couple things related to my runs, like the number of steps and the distance. Um, now, what we can do is we can also go ahead and start a new workout. I'm going to start this new workout, and you'll see that it's going to start to log it there. And it's going to log this data locally while I'm running. We don't want to keep sending it up to uh, an Azure database or anything like that. Uh, but when I end my workout, it's going to send the data up to Azure to be processed and stored. For this, I'm using an Azure SQL hyperscale database. Uh, this database is 16 V cores, and it supports all the data of all my users on my application. It's currently about 13 terabytes in size, um, and it can grow as big as it needs to. Uh, now, one thing I noticed with my users of this application is that a lot of people, maybe myself included, when we finish our run, uh, we forget to hit the end workout button. Uh, so one of the things that I've been working on is a machine learning model to kind of predict when that workload ended and then go and update the, uh, update the data in your app. Maybe some of your fitness apps do this better than mine do today. For now, I'm just going to manually update just to show you what that might look like. I'm going to manually update a run uh, from the other day just using this update command. Now, when I update data in hyperscale or in the database, and then I open my app again, I don't want to pull all the data down again. That's not going to be good for uh, my battery or my data usage. Uh, I only want to pull the changes. So something very interesting that we've done across SQL Server and Azure SQL is something called change tracking. Now, change tracking is going to allow me to, to use something called a change table, which you see there. And this change table is going to allow me to say, hey, I only want things from a specific version. And uh, using this stored procedure here, another cool thing, added benefit, is our support for JSON. So you can see here I'm able to specify how I want the JSON to be returned in my application, which is going to make it easier for me to process in the application. Now, this is just testing out that stored procedure as an API. So I can pull the from version, and now I'm just going to see that update that I just made manually. So back in my application, it's just going to see this update. So it's not going to have to pull all that data down. And what we did in the application is we actually made it so that new entries or updated entries are blue. So now we can see that exact update. You can see the numbers uh, match there. So I'm only pulling the data that we need. This helps in conserving my battery. It helps in conserving my uh, data over the wire, et cetera, et cetera. This is great for, uh, for my production workload. For my serverless workload, I'm going to get a lot of trouble if I spin up a 13 terabyte hyperscale database, right? They're not going to like that. So for my dev work, which you might you might understand why I need some work on this application. I'm going to use uh, Azure SQL Serverless. And right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off some changes, because the next thing that I want to do is I want to add temperature to the data that I collect, because maybe we can do some correlations about temperature and how a run went. So here I'm just using additional scripts to update uh, my database, just adding that temperature column, essentially. And uh, then again, all this is running on a serverless database, but we push this up using GitHub Actions. Uh, Azure SQL, SQL Server, all these services we've been talking about support SQL Actions. You can see it ran the first three, skip, three scripts this morning, and pushing it up uh, kicked off a new build. So it's going to go through and build the remaining scripts that haven't been applied yet. That would be four and five for adding the, uh, adding the temperature column. Now, while that's running, I want to show you this serverless database. I know I've mentioned it uh, several times before. You just see kind of the build process happening. But uh, this is a two vCore uh, serverless database. The nice thing about serverless is you set a minimum vCore and a maximum vCore. We're going to auto scale you on a per second basis, just bill you and give you exactly what you need when you need it. You're not going to have to pay for a bunch of extra stuff. You can see I also set up an auto pause delay, which means if I'm not using it, because it's dev test, separate the compute from the storage, and I only want to pay for the storage. So you can see this is the app CPU I'm being billed. And all the rest of the time, I'm not paying for any vCores. Uh, so that's a great cost savings. And then flipping back, we can see that uh, four and five have been added, so I can start updating my dev application to add 
the temperature calm. So I know that was a whirlwind. I think it's just one example of how we're innovating in a lot of different spaces. Yes. Sorry. The question is, I say it auto scales per second. Yes. Sure. So the question is, can you set a cap on the auto scaling? Yes. So I probably didn't explain this very well, but you set a minimum and a maximum number of v-cores. We'll auto scale you between that. So we won't go above what you say the max is. Awesome. Cool. Great question. I know this is a lot, but I just wanted to show there's so many things happening in the Azure database space. And uh, it's just really exciting to be in this space work on these services, see some of the things our team is doing. We're going to continue to innovate in the serverless space, in the hyperscale space. I mentioned distributed SQL. I think that's coming. Um, I think you'll see in Azure SQL, we're going to blend these serverless and hyperscale capabilities into one awesome service that auto scales and is limitless and doesn't have size of data operations restrictions. So really exciting space. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you all so much uh, for your time. I also want to apologize if this was too much random information. Uh, for that, I would love if you could give some feedback. Either way, positive or negative, I'd love to hear uh, what you think would be good here. How do we talk? What's interesting about other database services? Or maybe you just don't care. Uh, that's fine. Uh, if you want to stay up to date with me and what's going on in all these products, uh, Definitely check out our show, Data Exposed, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, it's a show I host, and my code producer's in the back, Marisa Brazil. She's the magic behind Data Exposed. Uh, so if you have topics or you want to check out the show, would love to have you on. You can also follow me on Twitter. Uh, mostly it's just SQL stuff. Uh, so if you want to hear about SQL stuff going on, it's a good place to go. And again, I know I'm over, out of time. So thank you all so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. We'll stream Data Exposed live tomorrow, by the way, in a session if you want to join. All right, thank you.